Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Romano, and I'm the Education Coordinator with the Base Hospital Program. Thank you once again for joining us for another webinar. Today we're going to be talking about 12 lead acquisition and interpretation. Uh, if you're new to this format, what you're going to see in the background is a PowerPoint, uh, and you'll hear voiceover from our two presenters today. You also have a control panel that you should be able to see a question or a chat box as well as a hand icon. So throughout the presentation, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to do so in the question or chat box. So type them out to us. We will read those questions and then answer them live throughout the presentation. If you do want to ask a question live at the end of the presentation, you can click on the hand icon and that will show us that you've raised your hand and have a question, and in which case we can then unmute you and you can ask the question live. So you will need a microphone to do that. Um, and so again, you'll see PowerPoint, you'll hear our presenters, and if you have questions, do so through the chat box, the question box, or by raising your hand at the end of the presentation. And so without further ado, I will hand the presentation over to Jen Robson, a pre-hospital care specialist with the Southwest Base Hospital, and Dr. Don Eby, local medical director. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Robson, pre-hospital care specialist with SWERP. And alongside me, Dr. Don Eby, a local medical director with SWERP. Our objectives for the webinar include the use of 12 lead ECG in the pre-hospital setting. We're also going to review possible conditions that can alter our acquisition and interpretation of the ECG. Then we'll look at the 12 lead in relation to some case studies. So, Jen, why do we do 12 lead ECGs in the pre-hospital setting? In the pre-hospital setting, we attempt to identify potential acute myocardial infarctions in the field and so support these patients to the most appropriate facility. For example, if it's a cath lab and a service that has a STEMI bypass program available. We have many patients that present us with chest pain, but they're not necessarily having an MI. A 12 lead ECG can help us to identify at least the transient or short-lived changes that we may see. Is this important in the emergency department? I think this is probably one of the most important reasons for doing a 12 lead ECG. Um, we see a lot of chest pain patients in the emergency department. A lot of them have changes on their ECG, and sometimes we know that they're old changes, but if we know that there has been a change or there are changes which are occurring, say, that that occurred when you picked a patient up in the pre-hospital setting and these changes have normalized by the time they get to the emergency department because you've given them oxygen or nitroglycerin, um, we can infer that the pain really was cardiac pain. And even though that the ECG may have reverted to normal, those patients are treated significantly differently um, and their, their follow-up and disposition is, is quite different than if they simply presented with uh, normal chest pain and all the diagnostic testing in the emergency room was normal. Interesting. Well, I've heard that the pre-hospital 12 lead ECG is one of the fastest for um, to pre-hospital care in North America. In fact, if you look at the 2010 American Heart Association guidelines, they mentioned four specific things. Number one is that 12 lead ECGs speed up the time for diagnosis. Number two, 12 lead ECGs shorten the time to reperfusion for both pharmacological and mechanical treatments. The third thing they mention is that EMS should routinely acquire ECGs as soon as possible for patients exhibiting signs and symptoms of acute coronary syndromes. And the last thing they suggest is the implementation of 12 lead ECG diagnostic programs with associated medically directed quality assurance programs such as steady bypass. So these are the reasons why we want people to do them. Um, the question is when or what is an indication for doing a 12 lead ECG in the pre-hospital setting? I think as paramedics we do 12 lead ECGs when we see patients with first of all suspected cardiac ischemia. That doesn't have to necessarily mean your typical chest pain patient. We also think outside the box and um, we think about atypical presentations such as abdominal discomfort, syncope, maybe weakness or unexplained respiratory distress. 
We also look at doing 12 leads um, potentially when we see an arrhythmia or if we have a patient that has a specific complaint or episode explained that could be due to an ECG, um, we may do a 12 lead in that instance as well. Would that be important, Don, if we saw a patient with a sign, a specific sign and symptom and we tried to capture an ECG at that moment? Sure. This is really important, especially for the transient um, arrhythmias. Um, several conditions come to mind because frequently we will see people in the emergency department who will complain of palpitations or a rapid heart rate. Um, and by the time they arrive in the emergency department, again, their ECG has normalized. Um, examples that come to mind would be um, a person with a PSVT or a, a paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia or I mean how do we determine it's that as opposed to a short run of uh, ventricular tachycardia or uh, atrial fibrillation for that matter. Um, again all three of those uh, conditions are something where the treatment and the disposition of that patient is significantly different. As well, we spend a lot of time or people uh, during the investigation of um, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia where we don't really know what's going on um, until we capture it on um, an ECG strip. And so this using the um, ECGs in the pre-hospital setting are, are really valuable, um, especially if you can capture one of these episodes. I think that ACPs also um, use the 12 lead for rhythm interpretation, specifically um, because they have the ability to treat specific arrhythmias such as PSBT or ventricular tachycardia. It's especially useful for an ACP in the setting of a patient presenting like that. Sure. When we look at placement of the leads, we're going to talk about the limb leads. Um, limb lead placement is critical. If the electrodes are not placed correctly, even if it's by one interspace, the resulting ACG will exhibit changes that could be misconstructed as abnormal and may profoundly affect the patient care. We generally place the limb leads directly onto the lips. Um, we try to avoid major muscles or arteries, and we place the electrodes on the limbs if you're thinking that there may be a 12 lead in the future. Sometimes we place the electrodes on the torso, um, maybe because because a patient has a fracture or an amputation, or maybe because we're getting a lot of artifact by placing the leads on the limbs. It's important to note that if the limb leads are placed onto the torso, we make sure that we document this directly on the 12 lead ECG. When we look at the chest leads, chest lead placement is equally as important as limb lead placement. We generally start by attaching lead V1. We find the fourth intercostal space just to the right side of the sternum, followed by the fourth intercostal space to the left of the sternum where we place V2. We usually skip over V3 and go directly to V4 where we place V4 at the fifth intercostal space left midclavicular line. We usually then go back to V3 which is placed directly between V2 and V4 and then we skip to V6 which is also the fifth intercostal space mid-axillary line. And then generally we would go back to V5, which is placed directly between V4 and V6. And sometimes this can be a little confusing on the scene. Now there's a lot of things going on. And what if I get my knee, my leads all mixed up? What you end up doing then is you get an ECG that sometimes doesn't make sense. So for example, as one goes across the precordial leads or the chest leads, uh, normally the R wave uh, increases as the R wave goes across. If you mix up the leads, you'll all of a sudden see one R wave that would follow, would normally follow, would suddenly become smaller and then the next one jumps up again. And what this does is it starts to put into question all of the lead placements so that if the leads are mixed up, you can't really be sure um, what you're looking at and it, it, as I say, it gives you patterns that, that don't make sense and then you tend not to, to count any of the, the, um, the other leads where the placement might be correct because you're, you're, you just don't trust uh, that the leads have been placed properly. 
field, sometimes we run into issues that are very important to consider. Um, the first issue we sometimes run into is privacy and dignity of the patient. So for example, if we're in a, a public place, it's maybe for that patient not the best place to perform the 12 bleed. So we end up taking the patient out to the ambulance before we're able to perform the 12 bleed. We also look at scene times. The 12 bleed should not cause excessive delay in the scene time, and it can be performed rather quickly and simultaneously with other assessments and treatments. Scene time improves obviously with practice and, and organization. So the slide says critical patients and what do you mean by critical? When we say we should consider critical patients we mean we should consider patients who are hemodynamically unstable for example. Those patients which have a higher priority of care other than a 12 lead at that point and possibly doing the 12 lead en route rather than on scene. Why are critical patients, Don, do you think, not considered as important for the 12 lead acquisition when we compare them to those patients with, for example, undifferentiated chest pain? I would say that, that once you know that someone is hemodynamically unstable and, and or have an obvious arrhythmia, the 12 lead in the pre-hospital setting becomes less important. Um, and that's basically because we already know this is a cardiac patient. And because there are, um, the, the, the actual things that you're going to be able to do in the pre-hospital setting then become um, less important than, than the time is to get them to definitive care. So, we already know that these patients are um, going to require more intensive uh, treatment and usually at that point the ECG isn't that important. So we just had a question come in that says please confirm where the limb leads should be placed so either on the ankles or wrists or on the torso um, and what we were trying to get across in that slide was that the limb leads should be directly placed on the limbs if possible, especially when you're doing a 12 lead. Um, if the limb leads are placed on the torso uh, while you're doing a 12 lead, it could exhibit changes that could be misconstructed as abnormal. Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, this sometimes is a, a question that comes up. Does it matter whether it's at the wrist or the elbow or the shoulder? No, it doesn't. Um, anywhere on the limb is fine. So we look at challenges to doing the 12 leads and 12 leads can be more sensitive to artifact than the 3 lead ECG and with that said, when obtaining a 12 lead, paramedics should promptly aim to acquire the most clear and accurate reading possible, even though that's extremely difficult in some cases done in the pre-hospital field. So what challenges do you face um, as a paramedic in, in getting the, uh, the, the ECG acquired? Sometimes we're faced with a lot of challenges, um, but some of them may include contact of the ECG lead. So for example, the patient's skin condition could alter that, and sometimes we have to clip or shave excess hair. We also look at movement, so movement of the patient. It's important to place the patient in a position of comfort. We realize that it's not always possible. So if the patient is in a position of comfort, we're aiming at reducing muscle tension to prevent artifacts. When possible, the patient should be placed in a semi-recumbent position for the 12 lead. And it's important to note that even small movements can produce artifact. We also look at challenges um, including movement of the cable. So the, the cable should have enough slack to avoid tugging on the electrodes. And that's not always possible as well. Don, I've heard that electromagnetic interference can cause artifacts. Is that true? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question, um, and it's it's debated. Um, electromagnetic interference has always been um, listed as one of the things you've got to consider, but I think it's probably more important in a historical sense because uh, historically, this was this was very much the belief. However, with the modern technology and the shielding, this probably is not really a big factor anymore. Um, 
That being said, any electrical device has the potential to produce target effect on an ECG. Um, and this is certainly why we, uh, we have policies about people in hospitals not using pagers, cell phones, portable radios, etc. around uh, especially cardiac equipment. Um, but I think in most cases these aren't in fact uh, real and the policies just haven't caught up with uh, what's really going on. Interesting. So what does the ECG represent anyway? Okay, so the ECG really just represents the electrical activity and it's a picture of what's going on with the electrical system of the heart at any one particular moment in time. And so what you're actually measuring on the um, the, the y-axis or the up and down axis is the voltage. Um, and this uh, represents um, you know, one millivolt um, is approximately 10 millimeters. The exact details aren't all that important. What's important to know is that the the stronger the signal, uh, the more the voltage will go up and down. And so the thicker the muscle is going to be the stronger the signal. Um, the other thing that is measured, of course, is time. And that's what the horizontal line represents, or the march of time along. And, and it is important to know that the boxes represent um, a certain specific period of time. So one, a one millimeter box, one tiny little box on the um, x-axis is 0 0.04 seconds. So five boxes or one darkened box um, that contains five of the little boxes um, is 0.2 seconds. Five larger boxes is a second. And what the ECG does is it represents, uh, each lead represents a, a, essentially what it does is it takes a picture of a, of a specific or a certain area of the heart. And because of the way the leads are placed, not all areas of the heart are seen with the 12 lead. And this is particularly so for the right ventricle and the posterior surface. Um, and this is why a 12 lead ECG isn't that reliable by itself for diagnosing right ventricular infarcts, um, which always becomes a question about, you know, should I use nitroglycerin in that case? The standard 12 lead ECG doesn't really show the right ventricle very well, um, and if you want to image the right ventricle or the posterior surface, then extra leads are added. But this is really beyond the, the scope of uh, most paramedics to either do or interpret. So there, there really are a lot of things that ECG can tell us. Um, Jen, when you're looking at an ECG, how do you look at it to get the most information out of it? So we've been taught to use sort of a systematic approach, Don, and we've always been told, well, take your time when you're interpreting this 12 lead. And a lot of times, we don't always have a lot of time to take our time. Um, when we look at the 12 lead, we usually use the five-step method. Uh, we start by looking at the rate, whether we use the 300 method to count the rate, or we count the number of R waves in a six-second strip and multiply that by 10. There are many different ways we can calculate the rate before we look at the rhythm. So we look at the rhythm and we determine is this a regular rhythm, irregular rhythm, or irregularly irregular rhythm. We then go on to look at the P wave and we look at the morphology of the P wave. We take a look also at the PR interval. And then we look at the QRS complex. And that one's really important because it includes the ST segment and we also include looking at the T wave in that section. So a lot of times the important piece of the ECG is the ST segment and the T wave for us in a 12 lead as paramedics. What happens done on the ECG when an artery gets blocked or narrowed? So when an artery gets blocked or narrowed, it really causes decreased blood flow, which then leads to hypoxia, 
hypoxia causes the muscle uh, not to function properly. And when that happens, its electrical signal gets altered. So you may see a whole, there's a whole series of changes that occur uh, depending on what, what bleed is looking at what section of the heart um, and uh, the degree of ischemia that's present. So ischemia meaning not enough oxygen, you'll, you'll get brief changes or changes in the ST segments and T waves um, in the leads that are facing the affected area. So for example, in the sample here, this change of, or an inverted T wave is something that you would expect in an ischemic area. And this diagram represents an area where there's infarction occurring, infarction meaning death of the heart muscle, then there's an area surrounding that, or there is always an area where you've got muscle that's still alive, and, uh, but is hypoxic and not receiving enough oxygen. And so in this area of the heart, the heart muscle isn't working properly, but if you can restore the heart, or if you can restore the blood flow and the oxygen, this area will recover. So again, the, the changes that one would expect to see are often a T wave inversion. Over here where it's looking at the, um, the area through the heart, you'll see ST segment, which this piece here is called the J point, should normally be up here, but it's depressed. Again, here's another, um, another example where the ST segment, which is this section in here, is depressed below what would be the baseline, which would be across here. So these are examples of, of ischemic changes where infarction is actually occurring. You get ST segment, which is this bit, ST segment elevation. So what would normally be down here has moved up here. Same thing here. Normally this segment would be down here and across and then the T wave, but you've got ST segment elevation occurring here. So all of these changes can represent um, muscle that's in the process of infarcting or is really severely ischemic. Um, other areas where the ischemia is less, or sorry, these areas where the ischemia is, is um, present but not necessarily having an impending infarction, you'll have changes such as this. And areas here where you're kind of on the very edge of it, you'll have ischemic changes occurring but because there isn't as much ischemia, there isn't as much change. Now we had uh, a question come in while we were talking about that, um, and the question was, does a 12 lead become mandatory in the setting of hemodynamic instability, bradycardia, administration of atropine, lidocaine, dopamine, or cardioversion? For these, the conditions that were listed in the question, these are really rhythm questions. And rhythm questions, um, the use of the 12 lead ECG can be helpful because you're looking at different areas which might show, for example, a P wave that in another lead you may not see a P wave very, very well. Or say on a, a lead two, you might not see the P waves very well, but it becomes clearer on a 12 lead. But the actual question, are, does a 12 lead become mandatory in the setting of the, these other hemodynamic instabilities? Personally, I would say no. Um, and for most arrhythmias, it's pretty clear um, what's going on from just, the, just, just looking at a lead two. So Don, we are taught sort of the definition or criteria for finding a STEMI. So this is what the software on the monitor is using as criteria. And it says present in two anatomically contiguous leads. What does that mean? What does anatomically contiguous, what does that mean? Okay, if we can go back one, or back two, I guess, to back, maybe more back three. This might be clearer. Go back one more. A big picture of the, of the chest leads. Sorry. So, Anatomically contiguous means basically that the leads follow one after the other. So uh, on the chest lead, V1 and V2 would end up being 
uh, um, anatomically contiguous because they're side by side. Um, if you want to skip forward and we get into limb leads, it gets to be a little bit more complicated. Um, but essentially, your, your septal areas are uh, leads V1 and V2, the anterior being V3 and V4. Um, those in the chest leads are what we mean by anatomically. So lead one is lateral as well, and I know that AVL it has an L incorporated, so we go with AVL goes with lateral. Now I'm at lead two, three, and AVL is the only lead left over, and I know that those are inferior leads. We also could use the LII, LI, ask backwards all method, which some paramedics use as well. In this instance, what you would have to do is have a printout of the strip and you would write directly on a strip to remember what you did. So if you see ST depression on an ECG with ST elevation in other areas, the ST depression can be due to two things. Number one, reciprocal changes, or looking at the infarction on the opposite side. Or number two, ischemia noted in the area with the ST depression. There are different ways to try and remember where we would look for reciprocal changes. The first one is AIL, or A-I-L, on the left of your screen. What we remember is that if we see ST elevation in the anterior leaves, we're looking for depression in the inferior leaves. And if we see ST elevation in the inferior leaves, we're looking for depression in the lateral leaves. If we see ST elevation in the lateral leaves, we look for depression in the anterior leads. The other way we can do it on the right hand of your screen is the teeter-totter method. If we put leads 2, 3, and ABF on the left hand side and all of the other leads on the right, we know that if we have elevation on one side, we'll likely see depression on the opposite side. So if I see ST elevation done, does that always mean there's going to be a myocardial infarction present? Unfortunately, no. Um, there are a series of conditions which will mimic um, a STEMI and cause ST elevation. On the slide, there's a list of possible um, mimics. I think the important thing here is that we presume that we're dealing with a myocardial infarction rather than one of the mimics, although this is this is obviously one of the things that makes ECG reading and interpretation much more difficult. It has to be done within the context of what the patient that you're looking at is actually doing. So, for example, someone with a hemorrhagic stroke um, is likely going and have ECG changes is likely going to be uh, profoundly uh, unconscious and not responding to very much. Um, which is not really a condition that you see um, with someone who's having an acute MI, who's usually there uh, holding their chest and, and, and talking to you. So you have to interpret um, what's going on based on a lot of other things. And a lot of the uh, mimickers of, an, of a STEMI, um, this kind of thing happened. So there, I guess the, the bottom line here is that not all myocardial infarctions will have ST elevation. 
because you can have a condition called non-STEMIs and you're having a myocardial infarction. Uh, but we want to pick up the ones who are actually having a myocardial infarction and specifically STEMIs because those are the ones Muted. we can make the biggest difference uh, to with either thrombolytics or with uh, uh, angiography and, and uh, PCA. Okay, so I think I've got this done. ST elevation is only presumptive of an acute myocardial, myocardial infarction, and there are many other causes, or w what we might call mimickers of ST elevation. Pre-hospital 12 lead ECGs can be useful tools to paramedics, and our goal is to acquire the 12 lead ECG as quickly and accurately as we can in the field. And a normal 12 lead ECG cannot rule out an acute myocardial infarction and you had also mentioned that non-STEMIs are biological, sorry, biochemical diagnosis made in conjunction with historical factors and possibly ECG, ECG changes and possibly not ECG changes. A patient may have a non-STEMI with a completely normal ECG. All of that's correct. So there are three Ask Matt questions that we'd like to touch on. The first question surrounds the order of treatment, including a 12 lead in a patient with suspected cardiac ischemia. The ultimate answer to that question is we're going to be working as a team, as a paramedic crew. We're going to be gathering an incident history, attaching the cardiac monitor and the oxygen, attaching a 12 lead and assessing for nitro and ASA, sort of all at the same time simultaneously. SWARP doesn't have a dictation on which procedure should be done first or second or even third. As long as we don't delay the same time, and we don't delay one procedure for the other. The second question asks the optimal patient position for acquiring a 12 lead ECG. The optimal position is one where the patient is semi-recumbent and relaxed to avoid muscle tension, and stationary as well to limit as much artifact as possible on 12 lead. With that being said, there are a myriad of scene factors that paramedics encounter every day, which may actually limit the ideal positioning and therefore as long as it's clear 12 lead ECG tracing can be acquired, any reasonable position is acceptable. The last question we'd like to look at asks, should paramedics do 12 leads on patients other than suspected cardiac ischemia? The answer to that one is that our previous directives had specific indications for completing a 12 lead and we no longer have a dedicated 12 lead ECG protocol. We have consideration noted in a number of the directives um, in our protocols, and what that means is that's at the very minimum. We would do a 12 lead at the very minimum on the patients that our protocol books uh, mention. Liberal, liberal use is reasonable in a hemodynamically stable patient as long as it can be acquired without prolonging the scene time. So now I would like to look at two case studies. These case studies will uh, illustrate what we've been um, trying to present earlier in the webinar. So for the first case study, um, you're called code 4 at about uh, 8.45 in the morning to the residence of an 88-year-old man who's complaining of back pain and chest pain. On arrival, you find the patient is diaphoretic, agitated, in obvious distress, complaining of 7 out of 10, heavy uh, chest discomfort, it's unchanged with palpitation, movement, respiration, uh, he seems to move, the pain seems to go down both arms, there's mild shortness of breath, and he was slightly nauseated. This is a pretty straightforward and uh, standard story to consider cardiac ischemia. Uh, further, uh, things that you gather from your history, that they're a smoker, they've got hypertension, hyperlipidemia, again, all risk factors for cardiac ischemia. Patient's wife tells you um, that her husband's been under increased stress at work, um, obviously working way past his uh, due date at 86, but his heart rate uh, you find is 50, the respiratory rate is 24, blood pressure 105 over 66, his SAO2 
um, on oxygen is 97, he's pale, diaphoretic, um, looks like a normal sinus rhythm on his uh, lead 2 and the blood glucose is 6.2. So what we'll do is we'll do a 12 lead ECG in this case because it's certainly indicated. Jen, what do you see? Well, in this 12 lead, I don't see any real evidence of ST elevation, um, but I do know some peak T waves, possibly due to some ischemic changes or possibly not. So let's say, Don, I have this ECG on scene, and I treat my patient accordingly, and I package them up, and en route to the hospital, my patient tells me they're now having worsening chest discomfort. It's 10 on 10, and they appear in some pretty severe distress. Do you think it's reasonable? Should I acquire another ECG at this point? Absolutely. When there's a change in a patient condition like this, especially with, with worsening, and you're, you're pretty convinced this is a cardiac pain, a change in the ECG is, um, if you were to pick up a change in the ECG at this point, this would be very significant. So let's just see what happens when you do the second 12 lead ECG. Okay, here's your, here's your second ECG. Um, obviously this is quite different than the first one. So Jen, how would this change your management? Or, or would it change your management? So I now see what looks to be an infralateral STEMI. I've got ST elevation in 2, 3, ADF looks like V5 to V6 with some ST depression as well. As far as my management, this patient now meets a STEMI bypass criteria if I have bypass available because A, he's complaining of chest pain and now he's STEMI positive. So I would probably look at following my STEMI bypass directive. If I don't have a STEMI bypass available in my area, it wouldn't make a lot of difference as far as destination, but I would definitely pre-alert and it would be useful in the emergency department. If the patient is hypotensive, for example, and I now have a STEMI positive ECG, I would go on to follow my cardiogenic shock medical director. Okay, this is a question that uh, came to us before the presentation was made. Um, someone wanted to know what exactly AVR represents. So lead AVR is an augmented limb lead. It's similar to AVL and AVF. It records measurements at a specific electrode with respect to a reference electrode, which is known as the central terminal. And you'll see that in the middle of the triangle. The central terminal is described as a reference point that is the average of all of the limb lead electrical potentials. The augmented leads, the central in augmented leads, sorry, the central terminal is calculated by the ECG machine computer. The electrical potential produced by the central terminal is normally relatively small. So the ECG machine augments or magnifies the amplitude of the electrical potentials. They usually augment it by about 50% in augmented leads when we compare it to those standard limb leads. So AVR represents a augmented or magnified, V refers to voltage, and R refers to the right arm. And as you can see in the illustration, AVR views the heart from the right shoulder, and it views the base of the heart, looking primarily at the atria and the great vessels. So we've had another question come in. Um, do we stop the vehicle to obtain a 12-lead ECG in a worsening patient? Um, this is a good question, and I'm not sure if there's a, a completely uh, clear answer. I would suggest trying to do the ECG um, as you continue to move along, but if you find that you're getting a lot of uh, marked uh, interference or you're not able to get a clear um, ECG, it's quite reasonable to have the patient uh, to stop or to have your partner stop the vehicle, uh, take the 10 to 15 seconds it takes to acquire the ECG, uh, to acquire a good one, and keep going. So the next case study is you're called code 4 um, at 1130 hours for an 80-year-old patient with syncope. 
this woman you find sitting in a chair um, with a GCS of 15, so an unaltered level of consciousness. She was in church when she had a sudden feeling of suddenly of being really tired, hot, and the next thing that she remembers was that she woke up on the floor with everyone standing over her. The bystanders had called 911. And the information that you received from the bystanders was that uh, she seemed to be unconscious or less responsive for about 30 seconds and she just kind of crumpled and they assisted her on the, uh, to the floor. So I'm going to let Jen go through the, the information that she collected as a paramedic on her arrival. So what I did was collected a past medical history. She has hypertension, osteoporosis, and she's had some episodes of weakness similar to this over the past month. Her rate is 70, regular and strong. Respirations are 20. Blood pressure is 150 over 74. SpO2 98% on our non breather, of course. Her skin is pale, warm and dry. Pupils are full and reactive. Cap refills normal at two seconds. Again, GCS is 15. Lead 2 looks to be like a normal sinus rhythm. And we did take a blood sugar, which was 7.6. Okay, so is, would you do a 12 lead ECG in this case? I think that would be a reasonable expectation. Sure, and I think it's reasonable, and this was another question that came in, is that we, you know, we do 12 lead ECGs in any cases where you think that there may be um, the possibility that this is a cardiac cause for the symptom. So either the person's having an acute MI, or they've had an arrhythmia, or they're having the so-called silent ischemia. So this case absolutely is a 12-lead ECG would be indicated. All right, so I'll do a 12-lead done. There it is. Okay, Jen, what do you see? Something such as an anteroceptal STEMI. I've got ST elevation in leads V1, V2, V3. I also have some depression or possibly reciprocal changes in leads 2, 3, and ABF, and some pretty tall T wave changes in lead V2 as well. Okay. How would this, how would obtaining the 12 lead ECG and having the availability to be able to take a 12 lead ECG, would that actually change your treatment plan here? For example, would you now give this patient aspirin, assuming that there are no contraindications, now that you have the 12 lead indicating that she may be having a uh, ST elevation infarct? Yes, I would. She's got a semi-positive ECG. I'm going to give her aspirin. Okay. Would you give her nitroglycerin? I'm not going to give her nitroglycerin. Um, when I think about nitroglycerin, I think about symptom relief. She doesn't actually meet the criteria because she doesn't have any pain or discomfort or what's explained as her normal MI pain. So what about STEMI bypass? We have possible consideration of a STEMI bypass um, if that's available in the service. Although she doesn't have any chest pain or discomfort. And I know a lot of our protocols say that you must be having chest pain associated with a STEMI-positive ECG. I think it's probably an option, Don, if I called and discussed it in some regions where they may allow me to do a STEMI bypass. And I think that's quite reasonable. So to conclude. So 12 lead ECGs are helpful for diagnosis and management of patients. And in order to be useful, care must be taken properly to acquire the 12 lead ECG in the field. Also, pre-hospital 12 lead ECG is useful to paramedics for the treatment of some of their patients, as illustrated in case number two. It may also change your treatment of the patient. Okay. That's really the end of the uh, webinar. Um, we had one uh, question, or one further question, come in, and that question was: Should the twelve, uh, should the twelve lead sticky stay on, or the twelve lead stay on throughout the call once it's applied? Jen, I think Don, 
it would be reasonable to leave the 12 lead on um, in case that you would like to take another 12 lead on route. So if you're suspecting there may be changes on route and, for example, your partner stops at a stop sign, you could maybe acquire a second 12 lead to show transient changes, which may be very helpful in the emergency department. Yeah, I, I agree. And that, those changes are the transient changes. Um, if we go to the references slide, please. Okay. You'll notice the second reference was a uh, paper that was done by um, Matt Davis, Mike Lavelle, and, and Adam Ducolo, as well as Shelley McLeod, that showed the utility of the 12 lead um, electrocardiogram that showed transient changes and how it actually changed the management of uh, patients in the emergency department. This was, um, this was uh, submitted to pre-hospital emergency care in 2013 and uh, is actually a really important piece of work that SWARP was involved in, um, or at least some of, the, some of the people involved in SWARP was involved in this. This, is, this uh, paper actually showed the importance of the 12 lead ECG and ischemic changes. So, um, you know, it, it shows that uh, we are, in fact, doing um, important work here. And, and I think uh, this is another reason why um, we should be supporting uh, research in paramedic care. So, Don, we have a couple more questions coming in. The first one asks, in regards to the current oxygen standard for acute myocardial infarction, recent research has shown that a greater amount of oxygen may actually cause more good in the presence of an acute myocardial infarction. And what is your opinion on this topic, and what does SWERP recommend? Well, this is a really good question because this is an area that there is still some debate about, um, although I think generally um, the, the research that has been done in this is, is pretty convincing. The issue that I think this question really talks to is how do you change um, what occurs in the system based on um, some evidence. And so what typically happens is it takes a while for uh, research knowledge to be A, accepted, um, B, uh, put into policies and changes and then have that uh, translated or, or spread out to day-to-day uh, -day practice in, in the field. Although the research certainly appears to be showing that this is the case, um, as in many other cases such as uh, stroke and uh, other conditions that we don't probably need to be giving 100% oxygen for most of these conditions. Um, the discussion and the policy haven't caught up with it yet. And so currently the BLS standard says that we are using uh, and we're expected to use 100% oxygen in these cases and that's the standard that we're currently held to and until the BLS standard changes, this is what SWERP will be following. We have a couple more questions coming in. The next question says, in case number two that we presented, the elderly female with syncope not yet diagnosed, if her 12 lead has yielded a normal sinus rhythm, could it still be reasonable to give her ASA as syncope can often be cardiac in origin even though she currently has no complaints? Good question. Um, and I think this starts to show that these situations are um, in fact much more complex than what a case scenario is deliberately uh, trying to show. So the answer to the question is, could she be given aspirin um, without any ECG changes? I would say no, uh, because you're not convinced that this is a, um, that this is even a cardiac cause. And so the problem is, and, and if it was syncope due to an arrhythmia, uh, giving aspirin isn't necessarily useful because aspirin is really only effective in uh, preventing 
uh, the clotting occurring and, and so a blockage of the vessel, which probably in the case of someone who has a transient syncopal episode, um, there's no acute MI going on and there's no evidence that giving aspirin would be beneficial in that situation. So if I have a STEMI positive ECG with atypical or no symptoms, I could give aspirin, but if I don't have a STEMI positive ECG with no symptoms, then I don't. Is that right? I think I would support that. All right, and the last question we have, do you think the timelines to get a person to the cath lab may be increased? Another good question. Um, these sort of issues are more around the um, how much time does it take to get someone there and what length of time will the, myocard will the myocardium um, withstand ischemia. And it's one of these things that the shorter the period of time uh, between the event and reperfusion, the less likely you are to have cardiac damage. The longer it occurs, um, the, the, more, the higher the likelihood that you're going to have uh, myocardial damage. So if the longer that the reperfusion takes, the less likely it's going to be successful. And again, it becomes uh, judgment. I think the, the, the gain that you get will become smaller and smaller and smaller, and at some point it doesn't seem to make a difference. Um, one of the th things, though, that we're faced with uh, providing paramedic services across Ontario is that there are places in the province where you will never uh, get patients to a cath lab in uh, an hour, two hours, three hours, sometimes four or six hours. This will just never occur. And although the time might increase, you know, beyond 45 minutes or beyond an hour and a half, at some point in the future, um, it probably is is not going to make a huge difference. But again, we don't have the research to back it. And in order to make those kinds of changes, there would have to be uh, uh, fairly substantial evidence to show that it, it does make a difference, which doesn't exist at the moment. I think that's it for all of our questions. So thanks, everybody, for joining us in our webinar today. We hope it's been helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thanks. Uh, huge thanks to Don and Jen for another great presentation, well attended, and some great questions that came through. Uh, keep an eye on our website, Facebook, and Twitter for additional webinars coming up and for uh, our events during Paramedic Services Week. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.